A marked change then came over the churches in respect to their spiritual condition. On the hypothesis that the proclamation of the second coming of Christ was in the order of prophetic fulfillment, and that the message was the present truth for that time, the result could not have been different. When a person refuses the light, he necessarily puts himself in darkness. When he rejects truth, he inevitably forges the shackles of error about his own limbs. Loss of spirituality, a moral fall, must follow. This the church has experienced. They chose to adhere to old errors and still promulgate their false doctrines among the people. The light of truth must therefore leave them. Some of them felt and deplored the change. A few testimonies from their own writers will describe their condition at that time. The Christian Palladium of May 15, 1844, spoke in the following mournful strain. In every direction we hear the dolorous sound wafted upon every breeze of heaven, chilling as the blast from the icebergs of the north, settling like an incubus on the breasts of the timid, and drinking up the energies of the weak, that lukewarmness, division, anarchy, and desolation are distressing the borders of Zion. In 1844, the religious telescope used the following language. We have never witnessed such a general declension of religion as at the present. Truly the church should awake and search into the cause of this affliction. For as an affliction, everyone that loves Zion must view it. When we call to mind how few and far between cases of true conversion are, and the almost unparalleled impenitence and hardness of sinners, we almost involuntarily exclaim, Has God forgot to be gracious, or is the door of mercy closed? About that time, proclamations of fasts and seasons of prayer for the return of the Holy Spirit were sent out in the religious papers. Even the Philadelphia Sun of November 11, 1844 had the following. The undersigned ministers and members of various denominations in Philadelphia and vicinity, solemnly believing that the present signs of the times, the spiritual dearth of our churches generally, and the extreme evils in the world around us seem to call loudly on all Christians for a special season of prayer, do therefore hereby agree, by divine permission, to unite in a week of special prayer to Almighty God for the outpouring of His Holy Spirit on our city, our country, and the world. Professor Finney, editor of the Oberlin Evangelist, in February 1844, said, We have had the facts before our minds that in general the Protestant churches of our country as such were either apathetic or hostile to nearly all the moral reforms of the age. There are partial exceptions, yet not enough to render the fact otherwise than general. We have also another corroborative fact, the almost universal absence of revival influence in the churches. The spiritual apathy is almost all-pervading, and is fearfully deep. So the religious press of the whole land testifies. Very extensively, church members are becoming devotees of fashion, joining hands with the ungodly on parties of pleasure, in dancing, in festivities, etc. But we need not expand this painful subject. Suffice it that the evidence thickens and rolls heavily upon us to show that the churches generally are becoming sadly degenerate They have gone very far from the Lord, and He has withdrawn Himself from them. Should it be said that our views of the moral fall and spiritual dearth of the churches are shown to be incorrect by the great revivals of 1858, the testimony of the leading Congregational and Baptist papers of Boston relative to these revivals would correct that impression. The Congregationalist, November 1858, said, The revival piety of our churches is not such that one can confidently infer from its mere existence its legitimate practical fruits. It ought, for example, to be as certain after such a shower of grace that the treasuries of our benevolent societies would be filled as it is after a plentiful rain 
that the streams will swell in their channels. But the managers of our societies are bewailing the feebleness of the sympathy and aid of the churches. There is another and sadder illustration of the same general truth. The watchman and reflector recently stated that there had never been among the Baptists so lamentable a spread of church dissension as prevails at present, and the sad fact is mentioned that this sin infects the very churches which shared most largely in the late revival, and the still more melancholy fact is added that these alienations date back their origin in most cases to the very midst of that scene of awakening. Even a glance at the weekly journals of our own denomination will evince that the evil is by no means confined to the Baptists. Our own columns have, perhaps, never borne so humiliating a record of contentions and ecclesiastical litigations as during the last few months. A Presbyterian pastor of Belfast, Ireland, 1858, used the following language respecting the then-recent revivals in this country. According to the New York Independent of December, 1859, the determination to crush all ministers who say a word against their national sin, slavery, the determination to suffocate and suppress the plain teachings of Scripture, can be persisted in and carried out at the very time these New York Christians are expecting the religious world to hail their revivals. Until the wretchedly degraded churches of America do the work of God in their own land, they have no spiritual vitality to communicate to others. Their revivals are in the religious world what their flaunted cries of liberty, intermingled with the groans of the slave, are in the political. During the time of the great Irish revival of 1859, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church of Ireland held its session in Belfast. Of a strange scene that occurred in that assembly, the Belfast newsletter of September 30 said, Here in this venerable body of ministers and elders, we find two ministers openly giving each other the lie, and the whole General Assembly turned into a scene of confusion bordering upon a riot. This is a sad and deplorable picture, and what has been the course of events and the tendency in the deportment of the professed Christians since that time. There is considerable spasmodic action in some localities, and much effort put forth by sensational revivalists to excite the emotions, but no permanent good seems to be accomplished, and the standard of godliness sinks lower and lower. Some new features have been added to the facilities for church work, and have now come to be considered almost indispensable appendages to the house of worship, and one of these is nothing less than a well-appointed kitchen, where the feast can be made ready, and dainty delicacies prepared for the most perverted appetite. One instance may serve as an illustration of all in this line. When the Centenary Methodist Episcopal Church was erected in Chicago, the Tribune of that city, in its description of the building, made particular mention of the following features. Beneath the vestibule and parlors is a basement, consisting of a large dining hall, furnished with table accommodations for 150 persons, a kitchen with cooking apparatus, sinks, closets, dressing rooms, etc. The basement under the vestibule and parlors secures some desirable advantages. The social gatherings can be made agreeable and pleasant without introducing the refreshments into the lecture room or parlors. Think of a kitchen as being considered a necessary apartment in a house of worship. What would the venerable and godly church fathers and mothers of a generation ago have thought of this? The scriptures declare that eating and drinking and pleasure-seeking, instead of God-serving, even on the part of professed Christians, will characterize the last days as signs of the times. Luke chapter 17 verses 26 to 30 and 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 4 and 5. Have we not reached the time when this is fulfilled? What indulgence is there in the whole catalogue of worldly pleasures which is not openly tolerated in the church, nay, which is not largely fostered by the church? Dancing, card-playing, theater-going, horse-racing, gambling, 
lotteries, festivals, fairs, and all forms of gluttony are freely patronized in religious circles, and many of these things for so-called religious purposes. Not many years ago, an entertainment was devised for the benefit of a church in New Orleans of such a nature that it required a handbill to describe it, reading as follows. Benefit of Christ Church Parochial School Near the dancing platform are a splendid booth and a large canvas tent, with seats reserved for the accommodation of ladies and children. The patrons of this church, as well as the public, will here find a soda water stand and confectionery, a restaurant filled with everything to satisfy the appetites of Epicureans, and also a splendid bar stocked with the choicest kinds of liquors, cigars, etc., The New York Observer copied this with the following remarks. This is a copy of a handbill, conspicuously posted in New Orleans at the present time. The church for which this splendid bar is to be opened is called Christ's Church. But our private opinion is, if Christ attends the fair, he will come with a scourge of large cords and drive out every man and woman who dishonors his house and name with such things as these. Call it a church if you will, but for Christ's sake, O New Orleans people, don't call it Christ's church. Anything but that. To whatever denomination this church belonged, it shows just the same what is done in these days in the name of religion. As an illustration of the effect of church lotteries, the watchman relates the following. A member of a church went to his pastor and entreated his personal intercession with his favorite son who had become ruinously addicted to the vice of gambling. The pastor consented, and seeking the young man, found him in his chamber. He commenced his lecture, but before he concluded, the young man laid his hand upon his arm and drew his attention to a pile of splendid volumes that stood upon the table. Well, said the young man, these volumes were won by me at a fair given in your church. They were my first venture. But for that lottery... Under the patronage of a Christian church, I should never have become a gambler. A minister, B. F. Booth, speaks as follows in the Golden Censor. I hide my face in shame when I hear of a governor of a state being compelled to call upon the lawmaking department of his state to pass laws to counteract the swindling carried on under the auspices of the church under the name of church fairs, festivals, and other forms of pious church gambling. Pages might be filled with statements from leading men and papers in the religious world acknowledging the low condition of the churches generally and the many evil practices of which they are unblushingly guilty. But it is unnecessary to multiply testimony on this point. The sad and deplorable fact is too evident to be denied. The leading Methodist paper, The Christian Advocate of August 30, 1883, contains an article headed The Greatest of Questions, from which we copy these statements. Number one, disguise it as you like, the church in a general sense is spiritually in a rapid decline. While it grows in numbers and money, it is becoming extremely feeble and limited in its spirituality, both in the pulpit and the pew. It is assuming the shape and character of the church at Laodicea. Number two, there are thousands of ministers local and conference and many thousands of the laity who are as dead and worthless as barren fig trees. They contribute nothing of a temporal or spiritual nature to the progress and triumphs of the gospel throughout the earth. If all these dry bones in our church and its congregations could be resurrected, and brought into requisition by faithful, active service, what new and glorious manifestations of divine power would break forth? The New York Independent of December 3, 1896, gave an article from D. L. Moody, from which the following is an extract. In a recent issue of your paper, I saw an article from a contributor which stated that there were over 3,000 churches in the Congregational and Presbyterian bodies of this country that did not report a single member added by profession of faith last year. Can this be true? The thought has taken such hold of me that I can't get it out of my mind. 
It is enough almost to send a thrill of horror through the soul of every Christian. If this is the case with these two large denominations, what must be the condition of the others also? Are we all going to sit still and let this thing continue? Shall our religious newspapers and our pulpits keep their mouths closed like dumb dogs that cannot bark to warn people of approaching danger? Shall we not all lift up our voice like a trumpet about this matter? What must the Son of God think of such a result of our labor as this? What must an unbelieving world think about a Christianity that can't bring forth any more fruit? And have we no care for the multitudes of souls going down to perdition every year while we all sit and look on? And this country of ours, where will it be in the next ten years, if we don't awake out of sleep. The second angel's message is addressed to those organizations where the people of God are mainly to be found, for they are specially addressed as being in Babylon and at a certain time are called out. The message applies to the present generation, and now God's people are to be looked for certainly in the Protestant organizations of Christendom But as these churches depart farther and farther from God, they at length reach such a condition that true Christians can no longer maintain a connection with them, and then they will be called out. This we look for in the future, in fulfillment of Revelation chapter 18 verses 1 to 4. We believe it will come, when in addition to their corruptions, the churches begin to raise against the saints the hand of oppression. See further under the chapter last named. The third message. Commencing with verse 9, the third message reads as follows. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is a message of most fearful import. No severer threatening of divine wrath can be found in all the Bible. The sin against which it warns must be a terrible sin, and it must be one so plainly defined that all who will may understand it, and thus know how to avoid the judgments denounced against it. It will be noticed that these messages are cumulative. That is, one does not cease when another is introduced. Thus, for a time, the first message was the only one going forth. The second message was introduced, but that did not put an end to the first. From that time, there were two messages. The third followed them, not to supersede them, but only to join with them, so that we now have three messages going forth simultaneously, or rather, a threefold message, embracing the truths of all three, the last one, of course, being the leading proclamation. Till the work is done, it will never cease to be true that the hour of God's judgment has come, nor that Babylon has fallen. And these facts still continue to be proclaimed in connection with the truths introduced by the third message. There will also be noticed a logical connection between the messages themselves taking our stand just before the first message was introduced, we see the Protestant religious world sadly in need of reformation. Division and confusion reigned among the churches. They were still clinging to many papal errors and superstitions. The power of the gospel was impaired in their hands. To correct these evils, the doctrine of the second coming of Christ was introduced and proclaimed with power. They should have received it and been quickened by it into new life, as they would have been had they received it. Instead of this, they rejected it and suffered the consequences spiritually. 
Then followed the second message, announcing the result of that rejection, and declaring what was not only a fact in itself, but a judicial judgment of God upon them for their recreancy in this respect. Namely, that God had departed from them, and they had met with a moral fall. This did not have the effect to arouse them and lead them to correct their errors as it was sufficient to do, had they been willing to be admonished and corrected. And now what follows? The way is open for a still further retrograde movement, for deeper apostasy and still greater evils. The powers of darkness will press forward their work, and if the churches still persist in this course of shunning light and rejecting truth, they will soon find themselves worshipping the beast and receiving his mark. This will be the logical sequence of that course of action which commenced with the rejection of the first message. And now another proclamation is set forth, announcing in solemn tones that if any man shall do this, he shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. That is to say, you rejected the first message and met with a moral fall. Continue to reject the truth and disregard the warning sent out, and you will exhaust God's last means of grace, and by and by meet with a literal destruction, for which there will be no remedy. This is as severe a threatening as God can make to be inflicted in this life, and it is the last. A few will heed it and be saved. The multitude will pass on and perish. The proclamation of the third message is the last special religious movement to be made before the Lord appears. For immediately following this, John beholds one like the Son of Man coming upon a great white cloud to reap the harvest of the earth. This can represent nothing else than the second coming of Christ. If, therefore, the coming of Christ is at the door... The time has come for the proclamation of this message. There are many who claim the name Adventist, and who with voice and pen are earnestly teaching that we are in the last days of time, and that the coming of Christ is at the door. But when we remind them of this prophecy, they are suddenly at sea without anchor, chart, or compass. They know not what to do with it. They can see as well as we that if what they are teaching respecting the coming of Christ is true, and the Lord is at hand, somewhere, yes, all over the land, should be heard the warning notes of this third message. It is now due, and if it is not now going forth, it follows that we are not in the last days, or that this prophecy is a failure. But this they cannot consistently admit. At the same time, they know that they are not giving it, and they do not claim to be giving it, and they can point to none who are giving it, except it be a certain class who profess that this is the very work they are doing. But to admit the claims of this class would be to condemn themselves. Their perplexity would be deserving of commiseration, were it not that those who will accept an embarrassing dilemma, rather than acknowledging the truth, are not justly entitled to much sympathy. The arguments on the two preceding messages fix the chronology of the third and show that it belongs to the present time. But as in the case of the former, the best evidence in behalf of the proposition that the message is now going to the world is to be able to point to events which demonstrate the fulfillment. Having identified the first message, As a leading proclamation with the great Advent movement of 1840-44, to and having seen the fulfillment of the second message in connection with that movement in the latter year, let us look at what has transpired since that time. When the time passed in 1844, the whole Adventist body was thrown into more or less confusion. Many gave up the movement entirely, Moore jumped to the conclusion that the argument on the time was wrong and immediately went to work to readjust the prophetic periods and set a new time for the Lord to come, a work in which they have continued more or less to the present time, fixing a new date as each one passed by to the scandal of the Advent movement and the discredit 
so far as their limited influence extended, of all prophetical study. A few, searching closely and candidly for the cause of the mistake, were confirmed in their views of the providential character of the Advent movement and the correctness of the argument on the time, but saw that a mistake had been made on the subject of the sanctuary by which the disappointment could be explained. They learned that the sanctuary was not the earth as had been supposed, that the cleansing was not to be by fire, and that the prophecy on this point did not involve the coming of the Lord at all. They found in the scriptures very clear evidence that the sanctuary referred to was the temple in heaven, which Paul calls the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man, and that its cleansing, according to the type, would consist of the final ministration of the priest in the second apartment or most holy place. They then saw that the time had come for the fulfillment of Revelation chapter 11 verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. Having their attention thus called to the ark, they were naturally led to an examination of the law contained in the ark. That the ark contained the law was evident from the very name applied to it. It was called the ark of his testament. But it would not have been the ark of his testament, and it could not have been so called had it not contained the law. Here then was the ark in heaven, the great antitype of the ark which during the typical dispensation existed here on earth, and the law which this heavenly ark contained must consequently be the great original of which the law on the tables in the earthly ark was but a transcript or copy, and both must read precisely alike, word for word, jot for jot, tittle for tittle. To suppose otherwise, would involve not only falsehood, but the greatest absurdity. That law, then, is still the law of God's government, and its fourth precept, now as in the beginning, demands the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath. No one who admits the argument on the sanctuary pretends to dispute this point. Thus the Sabbath reform was brought to view, and it was seen that whatever had been done in opposition to this law especially in the introduction of a day of rest and worship, which destroyed the Sabbath of Jehovah, must be the work of the papal beast, that power which was to oppose God and try to exalt himself above him. But this is the very work in reference to which the third angel utters his warning. Hence it began to be seen that the period of the third message synchronizes with the period of the cleansing of the sanctuary which began with the ending of the 2300 days in 1844, and that the proclamation is based on the great truths developed by this subject. Thus the dawning light of the third message rose upon the church. But they saw at once that the world would have a right to demand of those who profess to be giving that message an explanation of all the symbols which it contains. The beast, the image, the worship, and the mark. Hence these points were made subjects of special study. The testimony of the scriptures was found to be clear and abundant, and it did not take a great while to formulate from the truths revealed definite statements and propositions in explanation of all these points. The argument showing what constitutes the beast, the image, and the mark has already been given in chapter 13, and it has been shown that the two-horned beast which erects the image and enforces the mark, is our own country, now in mid-career, and hastening forward to perform the very work assigned it in the prophecy. It is this work and these agents, against which the third message utters its warning, which is still further proof that this message is now in order, and shows the most conclusive harmony in all these prophecies. The arguments we need not here repeat, it will be sufficient to recapitulate the points established. Number one, the beast as the Roman Catholic power. Number two, the mark of the beast is that institution which this power has set up as proof of its authority to legislate for the church and command the consciences of men under sin. 
It consists in a change of the law of God, by which the signature of royalty is taken from the law. The seventh-day Sabbath, the great memorial of Jehovah's creative work, is torn from its place in the Decalogue, and a false and counterfeit Sabbath, the first day of the week, is set up in its stead. Number three. The image of the beast is some ecclesiastical combination which will resemble the beast in being clothed with power to enforce its decrees with the pains and penalties of the civil law. Number four. The two-horned beast, by which the image after being made by the people is given power to speak and act, is the United States, and all but the final steps toward the formation of the image are already seen. Number five. The two-horned beast enforces the mark of the beast. That is, he establishes by law the observance of the first day of the week, or Sunday Sabbath. What is being done in this direction has already been noticed. The movement is urged on by individuals, by organized Sabbath committees, by politicians, indirectly by the infidel element, by the National Reform Association, by the American Sabbath or Sunday Union, by the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and by the Christian Endeavorers, with their good citizenship leagues, etc. But the people are not to be left in the dark in this matter. The third message utters a solemn protest against all this evil. It exposes the work of the beast, shows the nature of its opposition to the law of God, warns the people against compliance with its demands, and points out to all the way of truth. This naturally excites opposition, and the church has led so much the more to seek the aid of human authority in behalf of its dogmas, as they are shown to lack the divine. In the interests of these messages, the publication of a paper called the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald was commenced in 1850, which has continued to the present time, circulating in every state and territory of the Union, and in many foreign countries. The Signs of the Times, published weekly in Oakland, California, has attained a still larger circulation. The American Centennial, published in New York, devoted more especially to the subject of religious liberty, discussed in previous pages of this book, has a large and growing subscription list. The Present Truth, published in London, England, and the Bible Echo and the Southern Centennial in Melbourne, Australia, are devoted to the advocacy of the same views. The South African Centennial has recently been started in Cape Town, South Africa. Other periodicals have been established in different places and in different languages to the number of 19. Besides the central publishing house at Battle Creek, Michigan, with a branch office in Atlanta, Georgia, publishing houses have been established in Oakland, California, with branch offices in New York City and Kansas City, London, England, Christiana, Norway, Melbourne, Australia, Cape Town, South Africa, Hamburg, Germany, Basel, Switzerland, Toronto, Canada, and Chicago, Illinois. The catalog of books comprises a long list, from the penny track to the three-dollar volume, and the total number of pages issued up to January 1, 1897, was over 1,000 million. The list comprises books and papers in 31 different languages. 36 conferences have been organized in the American Union, Europe, New Zealand, Australia, and South Africa. In all these conferences, tract and missionary societies are organized. Hundreds of ministers and evangelists are proclaiming the principles of this message all around the world. This is a beginning and a promise of greater things. This movement is at least a phenomenon to be explained. We have found movements which fulfill most strikingly and accurately the first and second messages. Here is another, which now challenges the attention of the world as a fulfillment of the third. It claims to be a fulfillment, and asks the world to examine the credentials on which it bases its right to such a claim. Let us look at them. Number one, the third angel followed them. 
So this movement follows the two previously mentioned. It takes up and continues the promulgation of the truths they uttered, and adds to them what the third message involves besides. Number two. The third message is characterized as a warning against the beast. So this movement holds prominent among its themes an explanation of this symbol, telling the people what it is, and exposing its blasphemous claims and works. Number three. The third message warns all against worshiping the beast. So this movement explains how this beast power has brought into Christendom certain institutions which antagonize the requirements of the Most High, and shows that if we yield to these, we worship this power. Know ye not, says Paul, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey? Romans chapter 6 verse 16